G'day, I'm James, and I like to fold things. In fact, you may have seen videos of me folding fitted sheets and singing about folding fitted sheets, and maybe a video about me folding ties into awkward fractions, like a fraction of one third, or maybe a fraction of four sevenths, or maybe some weird fraction like, I don't know, 18 thirty-sevenths, some horrible weird fractions. Actually, in that video, it's not quite true. I don't quite fold them into those awkward fractions. What I do is I teach you a technique and how to fold a tie into, a into something so close to any fraction you like that the error is so small that the human eye couldn't possibly detect the error. Great mathematics, very simple mathematics, kind of cool mathematics. Playing with tie folding is actually kind of neat. But actually, this mathematics goes one step further. It actually connects to a very famous unsolved problem in mathematics. It actually goes back 200 years from the time of Gauss, but really formulated in depth by Emile Artin in the early 1900s. It's called Artin's Conjecture. This tie folding connects to one aspect of this conjecture, which is still baffling mathematicians to this day. So, by playing with simple tie folding, I'm giving you, right now, probably new to the world, I don't know if anyone's thought of this connection, a way to actually explain with unsolved mathematics today, and just by playing, you might stumble upon a solution and help out the math world tremendously. This could be very exciting. So the idea is actually think about tie folding, but think about, imagine you could get those perfect awkward fractions. Like here's an awkward fraction of two fifths. So there's a tie, let's pretend I got two fifths exactly. Great. So that's the starting point. You don't have to be exact, but conceptually our minds will say pretend that's exact. Now the trouble is with this tie, it's actually off the screen. So what I did is I chopped one of my other ties in half, so it actually was fit on the screen for you. So imagine I managed to get a crease mark right at exactly two fifths. So if that's two fifths on the left, that means I must have three fifths of the tie on the right. I guess it's a bit awkward. Doesn't matter. Conceptually, it's correct. Now, what I'm going to do is just do the tie moving move that I was doing earlier on in other videos, which is just halve the side of the tie that's easiest to halve. Well, two fifths is easy to halve because half of two is one. I could do that. Three fifths is hard to halve. I'm not going to do that. So let's halve the two fifths. Half of two fifths makes one fifth. So now I've got one fifth on the left. I had two fifths on the left. Now I have one fifth on the left. If I've got one fifth on the left, I must have what? Four fifths on the right? Which of these is easiest to halve? One fifth and half, awkward. Four fifths and half I can do. That makes two fifths over here now. Okay. Two fifths over here, this means I've now got three fifths on the left. So I had two fifths on the left, then I had one fifth on the left, and now I have three fifths on the left. Which one do I want to half now? Well, three fifths is awkward, but two fifths I can half. Half of two fifths is one fifth. And which means I've now got one fifth over here, but it means I've now got four fifths on the left. Two on the left, one on the left, three on the left. Four on the left is what it was. All right, and now I'll do the four fifths and half. That's the easiest one to fold in half. And I'm back to two fifths. So I went through my cycle. I'm back to where I started. But here's the thing about the cycle. We saw every possible fraction we could on the left. One fifth, uh, no, two fifths, one fifth, three fifths, four fifths, and then back to two fifths. In fact, we won't see zero fifths because I'm always folding somewhere in the middle. And we won't see five fifths because I'm always folding somewhere in the middle. But every fraction we could see, we did see. Five goes through every possible fraction. Five is a good number. In fact, also five is a prime. So I'm gonna put it in my, it's a good prime. Great, well, let's try another one. Let's try another prime number like 11. Okay, it doesn't have to be prime, but I'll do 11 for the moment. So let's do an awkward fraction like 6 11ths. All right, 6 11ths on the left. So all you have to do is fold the half that's easier to fold in half. 6 11ths I can do. Half of 6 11ths is 3 11ths. Oh, I better write this down. So 6 11ths, and now I've got 3 11ths. All right, uh, 3 11ths on the left, hard. 8 11ths on the right. Oh, by the way, this is why I'm always going to go for odd numbers on the bottom, because when you have odd numbers, got A 11ths and B 11ths, they have to add up to 11 11ths, one of those numbers, exactly one of the numbers, will be even and easy to fold. So right now we've got 3 11ths, not even, 8 11ths, ele even, easy to fold to 4 11ths. 4 11ths over here, which must mean I have 7 11ths over here. Can I write with my left hand? Oh, my left hand. This is my left hand, by the way. All right, so now I'm at 7 11ths, which means I must have 4 11ths over here. Uh, that means, oh, fold in half to 2 11ths and 9 11ths. I'm now at 9 11ths, all right? 3, 6, 3, 6, 3, 11, 9 elevenths. Uh, 9 elevenths here, 2 elevenths, that's easy to the 4 and a half, 1 elevenths, and 10 elevenths on the left. Uh oh, 10 elevenths on the left, 10 elevenths. Uh, 10, 10 is easy to half, to 5, 5 elevenths on the left. All right, now I've got 5 elevenths on the left. All right, 5 elevenths on the left, 6 on the right. Okay, it's gonna be here for a while. 3 on the right now, and 8 on the left. I'm at 8 elevenths. It looks like I'm going through all the possible primes, all the possible fractions. Uh, eight and a half is four elevenths on the left. And half makes two elevenths on the left. That's new. Still, oh my gosh, will I ever get back to start? Two elevenths on the left. One eleventh on the left. 
Oh my goodness. One eleventh on the left, one eleventh. And then 10 elevenths on the right means half that, makes five elevenths on the right, and back to six elevenths on the left. They're cycled. In fact, every possible fraction, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and where's eight? Eight, nine, ten. Every possible fraction appeared. This is a good odd number. Now the reason, okay, I wrote primes here. I could say a number like 15 is not going to be good. For example, if I did say 5 fifteenths and 10 fifteenths and then half that, the 10 fifteenths and half makes 5 over here and 10 fifteenths and half this, 10 back to 5, I'm in a little cycle of 5 fifteenths, 10 fifteenths, 5 fifteenths, 10 fifteenths, 5 fifteenths, 10 fifteenths, which kind of makes sense because that 15 is composite and 5 fifteenths and 10 fifteenths are really the fractions 1 third and 2 thirds. I'm actually doing the 3 case, not a 15 case. So you can see that composite numbers are never going to be good. You'll never see all fractions with composite numbers. So that's why I want to focus on primes. They're the interesting ones. In fact, it looks like the two examples we have right now, 5 and 11, are good. But is there an example of a bad one? There is. Let me give sevenths. Let's try seven. Let me clean my board a little bit. Sevenths. Um, give a fraction. Which, which sevenths do you want to start with? Oh, I heard you say four sevenths. Great. We'll start with four sevenths. I mentioned that earlier. Four sevenths on the left. Let's see. Do we go through all the possible primes? Four sevenths on the left. Which one's easier to half? Well, the four was easier to half. To get me to two sevenths. Great. Two sevenths. Oops. Uh, half of two sevenths. I can do that one as well. That gives me to one seventh. One seventh. Great. One seventh is hard to halve, but six sevenths on the right is easy to halve. So to halve six sevenths to make that three sevenths on the right. Oh, and I'm back to four sevenths. I'm back in a cycle, and these are the only fractions I'll see with sevenths. One seventh, two sevenths, four sevenths. I won't see three sevenths. I won't see five sevenths. I won't see six sevenths. That seems pretty bad to me. Whoa. Whoa. So we can just go through and actually list which primes are good, show me all the fractions, and which ones are bad and don't show me all the fractions. Actually, these are the interesting ones. I like the bad ones. But here's the question. No one on this planet, as far as I'm well aware, is saying or know, because they're not telling if they do know, where the list of good primes is infinite or finite. Maybe there's only a few good primes. Maybe there's only 102 million of them. Or maybe most primes are bad. No one knows. This is unknown. So you could actually start playing with primes, prime fractions, just play with the tie, and see if you notice any patterns. Because the patterns you might see could actually be new to the world. And you might say, oh, that's a pattern that's true of primes. They have this sort of particular property. And I know there are infinitely many of those, in which case there are infinitely many right here. You could solve Artin's conjecture, at least one aspect of it, which would be just mind-blowing, and I think it'll bring you instant world fame, at least amongst the math community. But who doesn't want math community fame? That sounds brilliant. Brilliant. So what I want to do now is I'll give you that I do know some of the numbers here. I wrote the list down. So 5 and 11 are also good. And need my glasses. I'm becoming an old man. Let's see. 5. Uh, 3 is good. Check that 3 is a good fraction. Uh, 11 is good. 13 is good. 19 and 29 are good. 37 53 are good. Uh, 61 67 are good. 83 are good. And now all the primes under 100 that are good. Every other prime is bad. The next prime that's good is 101. And that's it. But does this list keep going on forever? No one knows. So play with tie folding, play with the mathematics that you might see from these patterns of numbers. There might be something going on that no one's noticed, in which case you've just made a contribution to the math world, which would be brilliant. What I'm going to do after I clean the board is actually explain what Artin's conjecture is a little bit right now and how it connects with tie folding. So you can see this really is serious mathematics under the, under the well, I was going to say under the hood, but really under the, under the tie. All right, back in a moment. All right, there are two types of primes. There are even primes and there are odd primes. In fact, there's only one even prime number, namely the number two. Every other prime is an odd number. So it's interesting to think about the interplay between the one special prime two and all its odd friends. Now, Artin, Emile Artin thought about, okay, there is something deep about the number two, the prime two, and how it interacts with the other primes that's actually also mysterious. And he said, just look at the powers of 2. 1, 2, 2 squared, 2 cubed, 2 to the fourth. Just the doubling numbers. Just keep multiplying by 2. None of these has, uh, is divisible by an odd number. The only factors are other powers of 2. So these are the most even numbers of all in some sense, if you like. But he said, OK, but there's something mysterious about how these numbers interact with the other odd primes. For example, let's go with 5. If I say, OK, let's divide each of these numbers by 5 and look at the remainders you get. Well, you get a remainder of 1, a remainder of 2, a remainder of 4, 
8 divided by 5 gives you one group of 5 and 3 left over. 16 gives you 3 groups of 5 and 1 left over. Uh, 6 groups of 5 and 2 left over, remainder of 4, remainder of 3, remainder of 1. And look at that. You see all possible remainders appear. 1, 2, 4, 3. 1, 2, 4, 3. What are the remainders you could get? Well, you could get the remainder of 1, 2, 3, or 4. You won't get a remainder of 0. You won't get a remainder of 5. But you get all the remainders that could occur do occur. Just like what happened to us with tie folding. Every possible fraction that could occur, 1 fifth, 2 fifths, 3 fifths, 4 fifths, did occur. And if you look at dividing by 7 instead, look at the remainders you get. Uh, remainder of 1, remainder of 2, remainder of 4, remainder of 1, uh, remainder of 2, that's uh, 2 more than 14, remainder of 4, that's 4 more than 28, remainder of 1, 2, 4. In this case, not every possible remainder appears. You could have a remainder of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or 6, but we only saw remainders of 1, 2, and 4. Just like with tie folding. Tie folding, we only saw, uh, we saw, I think, four sevenths, and then we saw one sevenths, and we saw two sevenths, I think it was, or it was the other way around, some order like that. But those are the only fractions we saw. So actually, he was wondering, okay, which prime numbers are good with respect to the powers of two, and which ones are bad? Good means they give you all possible remainders. Like those ones. Or bad means they miss out on some remainders. Like those ones. It seems to be exactly the same problem, which is so interesting. Now, you might have to object to one little thing because the tie folding, wherever it was, was all about halving and this is all about doubling. It seems like the reverse process. But the thing, fact is, you can actually undo tie folding. For example, if you think about it, you say, okay, suppose I had something like three sevenths and four sevenths. Our process was to go forwards and go by half, half the four. But you can say, oh no, I could go back and say, where could this have come from? Where could have six, three sevenths and four sevenths come from? Well, three sevenths is half of six sevenths. So it actually could have come from six sevenths. So actually it could come from doubling the three. So actually, our tins question here is actually just the tie folding question, but it's done from the reverse perspective. We did lots of halving with the ties, or you can do lots of doubling by going backwards. Either way, it turns out to be the same problem. So, this is one aspect of our tens He asked, he actually had more detailed questions about how often these primes are good and how often they're bad. But he doesn't, no one knows if there are infinitely many good ones, even in this setting. No one knows. It is crazy that no one knows something so simple about the very basic numbers two and their prime uh, friends. Phenomenal. So, there's the invitation for you. Literally, you know what? You could stumble upon some deep mathematics. Just play with tie folding and try to see what structure happens. As you play with folding the ties, you might notice some pattern in the cycles or something like that that may have been unnoticed by every other scholar on this planet. It has happened. It has happened. So play with tie folding. Have some fun with it. Identify some more good primes. Find some patterns. Maybe find some subclasses of patterns that are good. Just play and you might stumble upon something amazing. Plus, it's just fun in its own right. You've got to love mathematics. Even the most elementary, most simple little questions are really portals to such magic and wonder and awe. Heavens, math is just fabulous.